Okay, so what I'm going to do today is uh, about some problems that I'm interested in in turbulent fluid dynamics. And I do mainly uh, geophysical and astrophysical fluids, uh, not exclusively, um, but um, mainly. So I work on um, problems of fluid dynamics applied to the Earth, uh, to other planets. You have a nice picture here of uh, Jupiter and its moons on the right, and applied to stars. Uh, such as the sun, other stars, uh, other um, uh, astrophysical flows, such as um, flows in accretion disks. These are disks that form around uh, central objects, such as black holes or perhaps stars, or around planets like uh, Saturn. We have Saturn's rings. Um, and I'm also interested in all manner of turbulence. And so, you know, turbulence in the Earth's atmosphere, perhaps, or turbulence. In, in say gravity currents or things like this. And I tend to do these things from a kind of mathematical point of view. Um, although as I was telling my uh, tutees a bit earlier, I've, uh, I've taken pretty much all the mathematics out of this talk. And it's essentially all pretty pictures uh, and jokes. So uh, we'll, we'll stick with those. What I tend to do is, is trying some uh, simpler models of the phenomena that we're trying to look at, trying to explain. So what I'll do in this talk is I'll, I will uh, talk a little bit about what phenomena I'm particularly interested in. And I'll show you that actually they're kind of a bewildering array of phenomena that you can look at uh, and try and get a, uh, uh, an explanation of. And they all kind of take the form of something that's kind of systematic, interacting with something that's very turbulent. By turbulence, I mean something that has a high degree of spatio-temporal disorder. I'm not going to go into much more details than that. And when you start start thinking about things with lots of uh, turbulence or lots of spatio-temporal disorder, um, you might start to try and think about these things from a, um, a statistical mechanics uh, point of view. Um, and so one of the things I'm interested in at the minute is whether you can use uh, some kind of statistical mechanics to describe uh, even very large scale behavior. So uh, usually we're used to using statistical mechanics for essentially uh, averaging over all the molecules or, or uh, atoms in a gas. Uh, and then we derive the fluid equations from that. What happens if we take the fluid equations themselves and average over those? because we can't solve them on the wide range of scales we need to for a planet or a star. And that's kind of I'm interested in, among other things. So let's see if I can advance the slide. So the theme of the talk, and there won't be any mathematics to back this up, is can the methods from non-equilibrium statistical mechanics help with problems in fluid dynamics, even for very large scale problems? And a problem, um, a facet I've become uh, interested in recently is uh, can machine learning help with this? So can machine learning help you try and work out what the statistical mechanics or the statistics of a turbulent fluid is doing? I've been collaborating with lots of colleagues in Leeds and around the world, uh, but my primary collaborator this is uh, Professor Brad Marston, who's at Brown, although I'm not really going to talk very much about the work. Um, so when uh, when we talk about statistical mechanics, it's uh, it's usual uh, that people kind of switch off because it combines uh, two of the words that people hate most, which is statistics and mechanics, right? And so uh, what you need is a good book for statistical mechanics. And one of the one of the the best books I've read, largely because of its introduction for this, is is the book by uh, Goodstein. Um, I don't know if Oliver knows this. Uh, but there's a, it's very famous because it has a, a very famous opening line for uh, for its uh, introduction, which says, Ludwig Boltzmann, who spent much of his life studying statistical mechanics, died in 1906 by his own hand. He goes on to say, Paul Ehrenfest, carrying on the work, died similarly in 1933. Now it is our turn to study statistical which is uh, encouraging. Perhaps it would be wise to approach the subject cautiously. So, uh, yeah, statistical mechanics does does en en engender fear and loathing in lots of people. 
he was really talking about statistical mechanics, equilibrium statistical mechanics. Uh, what I'm the, the the situations I'm going to be describing they're they're called non-equilibrium statistical mechanics, so that so they're slightly harder. But I'm going to spend most of my time just talking about motivation for, for what I do. This is this is what I'm going to say. So the motivation is really, as I've said, fluids in geophysics and astrophysics. I'm just going to describe for essentially the first 40 minutes of the talk. I know I'm, I'm meant to be doing this for about 40, 45 minutes. Some of the phenomena that we'd like to uh, explain. And I'm going to describe uh, some fluid mechanics of the sun, in particular the solar cycle uh, of Jupiter, which has a very interesting dynamic, and the Earth's magnetic field. Uh, which is kind of interesting. I'll talk a little bit about what we do when we're trying to model astrophysical or geophysical flows, and a little bit about why you might be interested in the statistics of these flows. I'll finish just by thinking about some interesting problems that I can think of in, in turbulent fluids, some of which uh, will probably emerge as CDT projects uh, that you might be interested in, in thinking about. Okay, so here are some pictures. So these are the kinds of things I'm interested in explaining. So I'll just go, uh, I'll go uh, through them. So on the top left, we have the sun. This is a, a, a picture of the sun actually in, in X-rays. Um, so X-rays, they capture some of the, the sun is a hot ball of plasma. X-rays will capture some of the, the uh, hot plasma that's tied to magnetic field lines. So the sun has a magnetic field. I'll talk a little bit about that later on. Uh, we're trying. We're, we're kind of interested in where that magnetic field comes from. So we have this hot plasma, which is um, um, moving around due to convection and um, and other uh, other pro uh, processes. And is the movement of the of the plasma in the sun, which is, we believe leads to the generation of the magnetic field of the sun. I'll talk a little bit about that. Um, the picture on the top right is of galaxies, uh, well, a galaxy, that's of a spiral galaxy. I can never remember the name of spiral galaxies, but it's uh, it's probably called something like M25 or something. They all, they all sound like motorways. Um, what you're seeing there is that there's quite a lot of structure in these galaxies. And the picture on the right uh, is the magnetic field of, these, uh, of this galaxy. It has quite a lot of structure to it, ordered structure to it. Which is kind of interesting. You might say these galaxies are huge. Um, how do you manage to get uh, ordered magnetic field from a very turbulent uh, flow? And uh, that's an interesting question. Uh, the bottom left picture is of uh, Jupiter, as I've said. Jupiter has, is very interesting because it's quite turbulent, but it has a lot of structures that are long lived and coherent, like the banding. We, we've seen before, the, this is a um, uh, signature of the jets on Jupiter, uh, and the uh, banding structure, and indeed the great red spot, which we might talk a little bit about, they've been around for a long time. And so despite the fact that there is turbulence, which is changing on a kind of daily basis, there's also this, this kind of long-lived uh, coherent structure that uh, you might want to try and explain why it's there. The final picture is of Saturn, of course, and I really just put that in because I think it's such a cool uh, picture. I haven't really said any, I'm not really going to say anything about um, about Saturn. Okay, so let me carry on. Okay, so um, let's talk a little bit about uh, two of these things. So we have the, the sun's magnetic field, uh, which I'm going to talk about, and also structure of Jupiter. So, you know, this is uh, the, the sun's magnetic field was first observed by the Chinese about 2000 years ago. They observed sunspots um, and indeed some of the Athenian uh, scholars. Um, but it was really only when the telescope got invented that people started making systematic observations. So Galileo used the uh, recently um, invented telescope um, to point it at the sun um and started documenting sunspots so this is one of galileo's uh, sunspot drawing you can see there are uh, dark can you see my cursor i assume you can hopefully uh, you see there are these dark uh, patches on the surface of the sun this is what galileo saw and uh if you put some of galileo's drawings together in a movie you can see that these dark patches 
Okay, I'll keep playing it. They move. Oh, no, that's not what I wanted to do. They move around uh, and uh, they move with the sun's rotation. So the first thing to say is this, the sun is a ball of plasma that's rotating. Uh, they change. They change on a kind of monthly uh, time scale. Of course, Galileo didn't know that the patches had anything to do with magnetic fields. It wasn't until the early 20th century that people uh, uh, could measure the magnetic fields in, in sunspots. OK, um, the picture on the right is a picture of Jupiter taken from the Galileo satellite. So uh, and um, so you can see this kind of jets. You can see vortices. This is the great red spot. There are some other vortices. Those of you, and I think I may have a movie or a picture later on, who've seen the poles of, of uh, Jupiter, have seen that there, there are arrays of vortices that um, uh, um, organise themselves in kind of amazing hexagonal or pentagonal patterns, depending on where you're looking. Uh, and um, we want to try and understand the uh, interaction of the turbulence with the vortices and, and with the jet. So I'll start off just talking about the solar cycle. So that's what that says. So here we go. So this is a picture of, of the sun um, taken in. This one is uh, extreme um, ultraviolet, I guess. And you can see these bright patches on the surface of the sun. And these correlate with the, those sunspots that we saw early in Galileo's um, uh, sunspot drawings uh, and what you're seeing here is hot plasma that's tied to the magnetic field that's come out of the sun it appears to be a movie so let me so here's it this is a modern day movie taken from a satellite called the soho satellite you can see the sun's rotating you can see all sorts of uh, amazing um, behavior here uh, that uh, is linked to the sun's magnetic field uh, you can see uh, kind of flashes that's a sign of algae being released. Um, you can also see probably that there is there's this line of um, brightness in both the northern and southern hemispheres, though at this point in time it's kind of more intermittent in the, in the southern hemisphere. So these are all uh, signatures of the sun's magnetic field. OK, we really want to understand what are the dynamics of that magnetic field, but more importantly, I think, where does that magnetic field come from? like the Earth, where does the Earth's magnetic field come from? What's generating it? So the sun's magnetic field has an amazing regularity to it. So let me show you this movie. So before I start playing the movie, imagine you take Galileo's drawings, but you could measure the magnetic field and you put blue when the magnetic field was measured going into the sun and yellow when it's coming out of the sun. And so you can see here where I've got my cursor, there's a sunspot pair, right? So you have a loop of field, which is yellow. So it's going into the sun and it's coming out of the sun here. This is a, called a sunspot pair. And this, we believe, is a manifestation of um, a deep seated magnetic field bubbling up through the surface um, in the fluid dynamical process known as magnetic points. One of, the th one of the interesting things that you, you've probably already noticed is that in the Southern Hemisphere, at least at this time here, uh, I've got blue to the right of yellow, okay? And in the Northern Hemisphere, I have yellow to the right of blue. So this tells me that the polarity of the magnetic field in the Northern Hemisphere is different to the polarity of the field in the Southern Hemisphere. And um, this, this tells us something about the structure of the magnetic field uh, and it's similar to the Earth's magnetic field in the in the fact that it's largely bipolar, and so the the field that's going round and round in the sun is anti-symmetric about the equator. Let me just play this movie because it's quite cool. So what you see at this time is that um, we've got sunspots in both hemispheres. We've got the northern hemisphere. We've got the southern hemisphere. And let's just see what happens as we go forward in time. Okay, so we're going to unfold the sun. So we're going to see essentially all the sun. We're going to watch what happens as time goes on. And I'll play this movie a few times. You can see sunspots coming and going. As they're there, they seem to move towards the equator, or at least their location moves towards the equator. And then they die out, and then they come back again at middle latitudes. 
But here they are at middle attitudes. Okay. I'm going to unroll it. We're going to carry on. Everything moves towards the equator, dies away. Starts again at middle attitudes, moves towards the equator, dies away. Starts again at middle attitudes, moves to the equator, and dies away. Okay. What we can do then is on this picture, we can essentially, every time we see a sunspot pair, put a dot. Okay. And what we're seeing here as the cycle progresses, I say this is the start of the cycle. All the sunspots are seen at, at middle attitudes and they propagate along to the equator in both hemispheres where they die away. Here they are dying away in 1990. And then they start again at middle attitudes and they die away. So this is the famous 11 year sunspot cycle. This is an 11 year cycle for the activity of the sun. And um, one thing I, I haven't mentioned yet is what's happening to the polarity. So I will I'll try and play this again. Let me just stop it. At this point in time, blue is leading yellow in the southern hemisphere. So keep it, your eye on the southern hemisphere as the cycle progresses. So here, blue is leading yellow. We're going to unroll it. The sunspot is going, so all the cycle is going to progress. It dies out. I can stop at this. I'm going to stop it now, which the sunspots have come back. And you see in the southern hemisphere, yellow is leading blue. In the northern hemisphere, blue is leading yellow. So the whole of the sun's magnetic field, the polarity of the sun's magnetic field has flipped. So my dog is now uh, joining in because he obviously agrees with me. OK, we'll just let him bark for a bit. OK, so I'll put that movie while the dog barks. Every 11 years, the sun's magnetic field flips after a minimum, which is kind of interesting. This is very different to the Earth's magnetic field, which is very stable and can be stable for like millions of years. OK. So now imagine we, we want to know what's happened going even further back in time. So this is very systematic behavior. If we just now don't worry about where these patterns are in the north and southern, southern hemisphere, and just average over how many, sun, just count how many sunspots they are, we get this amazing picture, which is the sunspot number versus time. Okay. So here's the 11 year solar cycle going up and down we can see it's modulated on a longer time scale so you can see it goes the actual amplitude of the cycle itself goes up and down um, these are all telescopic observations this is when galileo started um, started observing some spots what you can see is that there was this period in the um in the late 17th century um that uh, there was very few sunspots, and that's not because people weren't um, weren't looking for them. The French were doing systematic observations of. I don't know if my dog is ever going to shut up. Um, systematic observations of the solar cycle, but there were just very very few sunspots, and they got very excited whenever they found a sunspot. Through Marvel, even wrote a poem saying, "Oh, we've found a sunspot. Um, this is great." And uh, ode to the king, you must be great. The sunspots have come along. Okay, one of the say is that sunspots i'm not going to go into any detail about this are linked to how bright the sun is very very slightly as, when, as this solar cycle changes the total solar irradiance varies by about 0.1 of a percent something like that and so some people uh, and these people that usually have their research sponsored by big oil companies uh, like to say that what's happening uh, with the current um climate change, global warming, uh, whatever you want to say, is all due to the fact that since we started pumping greenhouse gases into the atmosphere around about here, solar activity has been going up. Of course, it came back. It's coming back down again. That's interesting. Uh, and so they say there's absolutely zero reason for us to stop uh, using oil or pumping greenhouse gases into the atmosphere. So I'll just put it on record seeing as we're being recorded. that This is absolute crap. Uh, and please don't listen to anybody who says that. The, the effect is just way, way too small. OK. So this is the solar cycle. It's somehow large scale in space and systematic in time. The sun is an incredibly turbulent system. 
So you're used to doing fluid dynamics, of course, and so you, you might want to try and measure the how big the uh, the turbulence is um, by uh, a non-dimensional parameter such as the Reynolds number. So the Reynolds number is a ratio of the uh, turbulent, um, if you like the inductive term, the uh, advective term, u dot grad u to the diffusive term. And so people tend to start thinking of those as being very turbulent when the Reynolds number is something like 10 to the 10 to the 4 flow, that would be a very big Reynolds number. So in the sun, the Reynolds number is something like 10 to the 12. So it's huge. I mean, this is a massively turbulent system. And so how do we get such regular behavior out of a turbulent system like that? Just going back to this picture here, uh, this is this you can view as just a time series. And of course, you might want to know what is going to happen in the future. Uh, and people really do want to know. NASA wants to know. Satellite manufacturers want to know because the sun's magnetic field has an effect on the orbital drag of satellite. It has all sorts of other effects to do with space weather. And so being able to predict what happens going into the future is a very interesting problem and one that I believe coupled with a knowledge of the way the sun's magnetic field is generated through machine learning, I think is an interesting thing for, for people to start thinking about. Um, so that's a possible project uh, for people to think about. Okay. Just to say one thing, I mean, this is going to be similar to what we're talking about in the, in the case of Jupiter. We know bizarrely, I mean, the sun is a very hot ball of, of, of gas. Gases do not have to rotate as a solid body. I mean, there's no reason why they should. So it doesn't have to rotate as a ball. Bits can rotate faster than other bits and cause shear flows. And we know that the sun, the equator, ro rotates faster than the poles. So there's a shear flow between the equator and the poles. Uh, this is this is very interesting. Why is there a a why why does the equator uh, go faster than the poles? I should just say there are other stars we can measure the rotation rates on, and some of those which seem very similar to the sun have the equators rotating slower than the poles. So again, this, uh, this interaction between the turbulence and in this case the rotation can lead to these large scale flows. This this uh, shear flow just sits there for as long as we've been able to measure it. I won't say how we measure it. Um, and uh, we want to know why it's there and why it's doing what we're doing. OK, so that's the sun. I'm happy to answer any questions on the sun before I go into Jupiter. Do you have any questions? Anybody still awake? Yes. Oh, okay, was that a question or just that you're still awake? No, I'm still awake. All right. Okay, so let's go on to Jupiter. So Jupiter, I mean, observations of Jupiter with the naked eye have gone back a long time. But again, when the uh, when the uh, telescope gets discovered and we start seeing observations or systematic observations of Jupiter, this is a, a picture that was drawn by, uh, drawn, painted by an artist, an artist, this is very interesting. This is a way of, of an early example of how to get your research funded. So what Donato Cretti did was he thought he'd draw lots. He, he wanted to, the Vatican to set up an, uh, an observatory. So what he would do is he would paint. He painted pictures of the various celestial objects that he thought it would be a good thing to, to observe. And then he gave them to the Vatican. So these are still in the Vatican Museum. So, I mean, you have to suspend disbelief a little bit about this uh, because Jupiter does not look this big in the night sky. It looks this big perhaps when you look at it through the telescope. And so this is a picture of Jupiter. And what you can see here is even in those days, you can see the, sorry, my cursor's on the wrong thing. You can see the banded structure that Cretti is, point, is uh, drawn in here. This is just a zoom in. And you can also see, amazingly, the great red spot. The great red spot's been there at least since 1711. So this is a very, very long lived um, structure that um, has existed for, you know, over 300 years. Um, 
Interestingly enough, Cretti made a mistake when he drew this. Does anybody know what the mistake is? Isn't it on the other side, like the bottom side? Yeah, so the grey-red spot's in the southern uh, hemisphere of, the, of Jupiter. Uh, and so what, what Cretti didn't realise is when you project through a telescope onto a screen, it flips the image. So he just drew it as he saw it. And of course, that's the wrong way up. And so he's got it in the wrong, he's got it in the wrong hemisphere there. But you know, a bad effort. Okay, so let's have a look at these jets. Uh, and so we're going to look at a NASA movie here. So NASA movies always come with a funky soundtrack. So I'll play it through once. I'll just let you look at it, look at it, and then I will um, talk you through. So what we're seeing here is Jupiter just on different scales. So hopefully you can see that Jupiter, I mean, it has a lot of turbulence. When you, when you zoomed in on the, on the smaller scale, you can see a lot of turbulent flow but we have these uh, banded structures, so you can see the, the shear. Okay, let me pause this here. You can see the bands of different colours. Uh, that's due to atmospheric chemistry, but they are signatures of what's going on beneath. If you keep your eye open, you can see that at some point the fluid is going, I'll guess here, to the right, and this way to the left, and maybe the other way. But just keep your eye on, yeah, you can see it here. It's going to the left down here. To the right up here this is a strong shear flow we've zoomed in again and we can see that the the shear flow here is interacting with even with all the scale structures this looks very much like a wave a wave riding on top of the shear flow so we've got these turbulent flows these turbulent waves interacting with the um with the um the turbulence is interacting with the with the, with the stable stable flows. Of course, you can measure these these shear flows. But this is this is just what happens if you average over um, longitude and take the uh, the shear flow as a function of latitude. Okay, at the surface, and you can see that there are these very strong equatorial jets, and they're super rotating, meaning they're going faster. And the frame of reference of uh, actually the frame of reference for Jupiter is its magnetic field, how fast its magnetic field is going around. And at the Earth, where the frame of reference is, you know, what, how fast the solid ground is going around, going around, and you measure winds um, in relation to those. The one thing to say is that uh, as you go away from the equator, here's the equator, the jets get smaller. In the sense that they're, they're going uh, narrower and narrower and weaker. Okay, but these jets are very, as I've said here, they're very stationary and very stable. Um, and there are two competing theories of where, how they're generated. They're either generated deep down in the sun, in the sun, in Jupiter, or at the at in a very low um, uh, at the surface of Jupiter. Um, I should say that how stable is very stable. Um, so um, these are the uh, observations as made from the Voyager mission, I think. Uh, but if I put on the uh, observations as made by the Galileo mission, which was uh, 20 years apart, you possibly wouldn't be able to see any difference to do with the thickness of the line, uh, uh, with the lines being this thick. These really have not changed in strength very much at all. And you think about how turbulent Jupiter is, that's a very interesting uh, phenomenon. OK, so here's so in order to to um, to settle the issue about whether these jets are um, deep phenomena or shallow phenomena, uh, they've sent up the Juno mission, NASA sent up the Juno mission, which is taking these absolutely amazing pictures of Jupiter. You can see here. Uh, vortices, uh, jets, turbulence. Uh, you, you can't quite see here the uh, hole 
the the array of vortices i may have a picture of that a bit later on uh that i just just sat there um so the juno mission is 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 there to actually measure various things it's going to measure the uh how deep the jets go and how it measures that is really clever it does it by measuring the amount of gravity the gravity coefficient uh is it's there to measure um magnetic field of jupiter which is interesting for those people of like me who who try and explain where the the uh the magnetic field is generated in planets and stars um and it's also trying to measure some um i think it's trying to measure some um um composition as well so what it does is it sends back very good movies this is the uh where jupiter's going sorry where juno is going so this is where juno is planning to go time and you can see it's going to get very very close and in fact it has probably about five or six of these passes already so it gets very 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 close to jupiter and so this is going to be one of the closest uh, measurements we're ever going to get of um, of, a, of, a, of a system like um, where you've got uh, turbulent flows uh, generating magnetic field in a so-called uh, dynamo. Uh, we, we are sending something quite close to the sun as well, the Parker Solar Probe. Um, but it's, anywhere near, near as close as the, as the Juno mission will to uh, Jupiter. Okay. So here's what it is. This, this movie always makes me feel a little bit sick. Uh, so this really is, you can see these amazing vortices here. So this is on one of its flybys here. You can see things that look like uh, turbulent vortex streets on calm vortex streets. There is the instability of a shear flow. Now going past. Coming out the other side. Pretty cool. You just get you're just beginning to be able to see this this maybe maybe not quite the array of vortices at the poles jupiter okay okay this is a this is a, another movie i think it was just a carry on of the movie So what you're seeing is that in a lot of astrophysical situations, the uh, you do get this turbulence it does interact with long lived shear flows, jets, whatever you want to call them. And this is all to do with the interaction with rotation. All of these astrophysical bodies are rotating. And therefore, um, the interaction of turbulence with rotation leads to these long structures. And uh, that's really uh, a very interesting problem, I think. So, primarily, I'm interested in generation of magnetic field, like so on the Sun. Well, Jupiter's, Jupiter has a magnetic field, uh, so does the Earth. And also, the, the interaction of turbulence with shear flows and jets. So we're really trying to understand where these things come from. So we do have some jets uh, closer to home. Um, if you have a look at the ocean, um, the oceans are very turbulent. But if you do some averaging, so you take the velocity um, in the ocean and you average over time, then you get these amazing jet-like structures. So the the the, um, the top picture is the um, is, a, is is the actual observations, and the bottom picture is a numerical simulation of flow in the oceans and again you can see lots and lots of turbulence so if you average for long time of course you can measure these currents these shear flows which persist over time and what's interesting is that the interaction of the turbulence with the with the um the shear flows can lead to interesting mixing properties and mixing is a very interesting problem and 
the oceanographers have been interested in this for years, how to work out how much mixing is being done, especially if, if you're wanting to like store carbon. Carbon is stored in the upper layers of the ocean, well, it's stored throughout the ocean. How, how much th these things can get mixed, how much phytoplankton, all these things can get mixed. Uh, so they've been devising strategies for measuring the amount of mixing. Uh, and one of the things, one of the projects of the CDT is, uh, that we're going to maybe get onto if I have time, probably not, is can you use some of these uh, measures of mixing that have come from the ocean, oceanographic, oceanographic uh, literature to understand mixing in a situation that you might think is completely different, which is the mixing of, of flows in hospital wards, um, bizarrely. Uh, so this, this would be a, a a um, joint project with Kath Nuss, who I'm sure you're all aware is is doing a sterling job trying to keep us all safe from COVID. Try and understand if you can say anything about mixing in 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 uh, in, in indoor environments. I think is the is the simplest way of, of saying. It. Okay, so I realise I'm kind of running out of time. Okay, there are jets in the atmosphere. Um, so this is, of course, the uh, jet stream. Uh, this one, is, it's, uh, it's a jet. There's lots of turbulence. The Earth is, of course, rotating. So you can see that these vortices here. They interact with this jet. The jet actually is very non-axisymmetric. It's very different from Jupiter's jets, which just went kind of straight around the planet. Um, but again, th this, one is, this one is caused by a slightly different mechanism, uh, we believe. Uh, the the um, the Earth is, of course, differentially heated, uh, so the equator gets more heat than the poles. That sets up a flow, cellular flow, and that can transport angular momentum and also lead to the formation of jets. Um, again, this is the interaction of jets um, with turbulence. So, well, hopefully you're getting the idea that jets are fairly ubiquitous. We find them all over the place, and they're always interacting with turbulence. So the final kind of situation I'm kind of interested in is what's going on in the earth, in the interior of the earth. Um, and what's going on in the interior of the earth is the generation of the earth's magnetic field. So uh, I'm sure some of you know at least that the earth is split up into a, a series of levels. There's the crust, there's the mantle. The mantle is a, is a, is a fluid but it's moving incredibly slowly. It has a kind of very very slow um convection going on in the in the earth and of course it's the movement of the convection it's the convection that leads to the movement of the tectonic plates um there's an inner core of the earth uh solid um solid inner core and then the re the region that i'm particularly interested in is there's a fluid outer core the fluid outer core of the earth where Fluid can move around, it can interact with magnetic field, it can generate magnetic field uh, due to the fact that the uh, fluid is coming and, and it's this movement, this convectively driven movement that generates the magnetic field there, the so-called dynamo. So this is a nice picture uh, of a dynamo calculation, actually, on a supercomputer a long time ago, actually in the 1990s. It was a heroic calculation at the time. You can learn something about what the Earth's magnetic field did in the past, essentially what's called paleomagnetism. You look at the magnetic objects, and you can see that the Earth's magnetic field has flipped. It, it, the North Pole is, has not always been the North. It flips, but it flips on a completely different time scale from the Sun. The, sun flip, the Sun's magnetic field flips every 11 years, uh, whereas the Earth's magnetic field, you have to wait something like, well, this is in, in mega Anums, as it were, so millions of years. So you might go nearly a million years and then you flip. And then you might go a couple of hundred thousand years. And flip. But you might kind of flip on a very short time scale and then go back. And this is an example. This time series here is an example of something that's happening only rarely. There's a new mathematical field of rare event theory which um, tries to understand things that happen only rarely by looking at problems where um, essentially uh, you're trying to explain why things uh, happen 
only rarely. And if you're doing a numerical calculation, it may not, it may, you may not be able to integrate for long enough to see one of these rare. Ones. So how then do you start looking at that are, are rare? At the edges of your distribution, again, that's where statistical. So if you use this rare event theory, you, you can begin to start simulating many, many, many of these rare events. And so again, there's a project in the CD, or there will be a project in the CDT, looking at how one can apply this mathematical idea of rare event theory, something like the Earth interior. I'm going to finish with a tiny bit of theory. Um, and I'm just going to say one way of which I approach these problems. I just wanted to say there are two types of, I talked all the time about interaction of turbulence with mean flows. And you can think from a, from a theoretical point of view of two different ways of having a, a mean flow and, and turbulence. One is you put energy into the mean flow. That mean flow goes unstable. When it goes unstable, it generates a turbulence. And I'm sure you're all aware of an example here, which comes from solar physics. You don't really need to know what it is. I've just got a large scale flow here. It's going to go unstable to, uh, in an instability. M equals one instability. See, here comes the instability on my planet. It's going to go turbulent. Here comes the turbulence. This is a numerical simulation that one of my uh, ex students did. And eventually, you have uh, the modification of the mean flow by the two. So you can think of examples that you know about this, like Kelvin Helmholtz instability. You've seen that where you have a shear flow going unstable. Taylor Couette flow, um, pipe flow, flow down a pipe. The laminar profile doesn't say stable, it goes unstable and then modifies the profile of the pipe. That's one way getting an interaction of turbulence with uh, mean flows. The other way is to put the energy into the turbulence and see if you can get a mean flow out of this. And in general, you won't, except if you break some symmetry by rotating the system. And of course, all planets and stars are rotating. And so this is an example where I'm going to put energy into the small scales, the moderate scales. It's going to go turbulent. Here it is going turbulence, turbulent. Um, we have a nice picture here of the turbulence. And what's going to happen is the mean flow is going to emerge. So you'll be able to see that when the colors start segregating. Uh, the, um, the colors are representative of the radial component of the vorticity. And so if I have all red here and all blue here, that means I've got some vorticity of one sign in the, north, in the southern hemisphere with a different sign in the northern hemisphere. And so if I've got vorticity of different signs, that's like having a jet. That would be a, a, an unstable jet. And of all the examples I gave you, pretty much all the examples were examples of, of that. OK, so just, um, just to say, what is the connection between all the things that I've shown you? Order emerges from a turbulent flow. I know that rotation plays a key role uh, because well, I just do, and some conspire to give some order in the large scales. Okay, and the question then is, how do we go about modeling this? I'm not going to uh, talk very much about it, but what, what's the problem with just bunging it on a computer? I know that I have a Navier Stokes equation. I may have a compressible fluid, so I may have a continuity equation and energy equation or a gas law. It could be incompressible fluid, in which case, you know, I just need to keep div u is equal to zero, get rid of all of these, all of these other ones. This is the evolution equation for the magnetic field. Don't worry, well, I've seen that before. But my point is that I know all the equations. Why can't I just bung it onto a computer? But as I kind of alluded to, all the non-dimensional parameters just too big. So, you know, red number, which you can think of as a good measure of how turbulent it is, and in the sun, you know, 10 to the 13, which you get. And quite a lot of the other parameters that you think should be, you quite like to be order one, so you can them um, really problem. Okay, so I will skip what we do. Um, but just to kind of finish off, the very 
famous Rollick Lorenz kind of nailed it on the head for a strategy for dealing with these things. Of course, he was dealing with meteorological observation. He says, more than any other theoretical procedure, numerical integration is also subject to the criticism that it yields little insight into the problem. Computed numbers are not only processed like data, but they look like data. And a study of them may be no more enlightening than a study of real meteorological observations. An alternative procedure, which does not suffer this disadvantage, consists of deriving a new system of equations whose unknowns are the statistics themselves. And that is where statistical mechanics, if you like, the statistical mechanics of the fluid dynamics equations that come in. And we took this idea and we kind of uh, have done quite a lot with it. And we we uh, we call this a statistical simulation. If anybody's interested in how we do this, you can obviously come and talk to me, but I don't have time to go into the mathematical um, formalism of this. So I will ignore all that. Uh, and I'll ignore that as well. So I'll finish, this is my last slide, by thinking about some interesting problems to think about. Uh, so as you've seen, there's a kind of breathtaking beauty of the astrophysical phenomena in our own backyard. Uh, and you can explore further in some of the projects suggested that I should be coming your way quite soon. We've had to, we've all had to put them in by the end of October. So then we have to review them and they'll be coming your way probably sometime in December, I would guess. Uh, some of the projects, they, they all involve like, mathematical approaches to turbulent flows, coupled to, you know, high uh, machine learning may also play a key role. So here are just some of the projects that have been put forward by me in collaboration with some um, collaborators in different uh, schools, uh, earth and environment and engineering. So how can we understand does that take place in the Earth's core? That's, uh, that's a very interesting problem to do with rapid rotation interacting with convection. And that's following on from a current CT student who's just handed, uh, well, he's just passed his viva actually. So he, he got some very interesting results and we'd like somebody to carry on. Something I talked about, the event theory, gives an insight into the reversals of a magnetic theory. Question How do we know whether our models are correct? Can we somehow quantify the uncertainty of our models? Can we do that validation of our models? If you have a model and you have an experiment, what's the best way of the model? The model is probably incomplete in the experiment. How can you mathematically determine whether your model is correct? Then the final one, which I think is kind of interesting, is like, can we take methods from open dynamics? and use them to learn something interesting about the spread of viruses in hospitals. I'm not saying what the answer to that is, but it's an interesting question to ask.